What's been the hardest part of your priesthood? It's very hard to see a young person who is involved in the church and to see them be led astray. We have to do our best to give them the nourishment, the spiritual nourishment that they need. Is that why you started your TikTok account? Yeah, I mean, it was at the time of the COVID lockdowns and people were really scared. They weren't coming to church often. And so I was actually talking to my little cousin and she showed me a video on TikTok of Catholic and Christian content on the app. So I said, we got to get the message out to people. We have to reach people where they are. Father Simon Asaki, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Lila. Thanks for having me. You are the, the TikTok priest. <laughs> I've been doing that for a little while. Yes, it's a big part of my ministry and I and I really enjoy it. I think you might be the most followed priest on TikTok. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I mean, at least from the beginning of my TikTok ministry, um, <laughs> at least from the beginning, I was... I mean, I didn't really see a lot of priests on the app. Yes. And so I think that's also one of the reasons why my account got pretty popular is because you'll be scrolling and you'll see videos of people dancing and of other random stuff. And then all of a sudden, oh, there's a guy with a collar. And a beard. Too. And a beard, they too. They like beards and on bald. TikTok. <laughs> and so then I started to do different things as well, like, you know, eating food and trying out different things. And so it got pretty popular. <laughs> All right. So I want to talk about your content. I also want to talk about your story because it's very powerful in your vocation. Yeah. Also your history. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know about the experience of Christians, especially in Iran, mm -hmm. in Iraq, in the Middle East. And so yeah. there's so much here to deep dive. But first of all, tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah. And I want to hear your vocation story too. Sure. Yes. Thank you so much, Lila. Um, I am a first generation Chaldean American. So maybe people have heard of Chaldeans from the book of Genesis because Abraham is from Ur of the Chaldeans. Mm. So he was from the region of the Chaldeans, which are the some of the ancient inhabitants, original inhabitants of Mesopotamia. Wow. And they speak Aramaic. And so there's a lot of connection with Jesus, you know, who spoke Aramaic too, right? So it's a very ancient people from the region of Mesopotamia, like I said. And so my parents were born there. They were actually born in Baghdad, which is the capital of, of Iraq, which is still in Mesopotamia. But Chaldeans lived in the northern region. It was called Nineveh. Now it's called the Mosul Plain. And so there are a lot of villages around there that are, are just uh, Chaldean Catholic people. There's, there's Assyrians and Syriacs as well that live over there to this day to this day so you have yeah. all these pockets of chaldean catholic yeah in Iraq, like in you'll, northern Iraq. you'll walk into a village and you know i've had read about villages in the bible you know obviously but i've never experienced it until 2019 so i was born mm -hmm. here and i went there in 2019 and for the first time i i was really shocked i had heard about it but i was really shocked to see a village that's completely chaldean catholics and there's a church in the center of it and it's it's the most beautiful thing to witness and to be a part of. My parents didn't live in the villages. Their their parents moved to Baghdad, to the city. And so they also started to speak Arabic as well, because it's the, city, it's the language of the country. And they moved here to America in the late 70s. And there were multiple reasons for the move. A lot of people were moving. But my, my grandpa, who worked in the government of uh, Saddam Hussein, he foresaw that there would be chaos in the region and mm. and a lot of people foresaw that and they knew that it was going to turn very bad very fast and so they got out of there before it turned really bad meaning they were afraid of of like civil war and conflict or they were afraid of persecution because they were christians both both and especially because if saddam were to fall mm. there would be chaos and that's what uh, um, i remember when i was really young it's like, I don't know, 10 years old. And we we're watching the news with my grandpa. And it was the day that Saddam had fallen. And I saw the people, they were like desecrating a statue. And I thought that it was a very joyful moment for the country because the, the dictator is gone. And so now they're going to be free. But I just remember very shockingly that my grandpa was very sad at that moment. And I just asked him, I said, what's what's going on? Like, isn't this a great thing that there's no more dictator and that the people are going to be free now? And he said, it's going to be chaos after this, you know? 
And so and it was, and, and it definitely was because all of the groups, you know, not to say that, you know, he was a peaceful person, but he had control of all of the, mm. the groups that wanted to rise up and be revolutionaries. When he fell, all of these groups started to take power. And, you know, that's how um, Al-Qaeda became a thing. ISIS eventually. So I had a qu I have a question about that because what's so fascinating is, so the dictator Saddam Hussein falls. I think everyone, even, you know, people that 9-11 was before they were born, mm -hmm. you know, they know the name Saddam Hussein, yeah. the evil dictator, you know, that fell in Iraq. But you were saying your parents you know, there were not maybe not your parents, but there were Christians, Chaldean Catholics mm -hmm. living in these villages peacefully mm -hmm. in yeah. northern Iraq. Was that under Saddam Hussein? It was under him. So he let Christians he, live peacefully? He let Christians live. And in fact, uh, most of his employees were, were, were Christians. Mm -hmm. That's because he trusted them more. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But how does that work when he was committing all these human rights abuses? It wasn't really a r religious thing for him. He... Just, just wanted power. Wanted power. So, yeah, it was not a religious thing for him. He just wanted power. And so, you know, he didn't necessarily favor the Chaldean Christians more than others, but he basically treated them more or less the same and gave them their more or less freedom, right, to, to worship and to live. And so what happened was my family left and they came here, like I said, in the late 70s. And that's when a lot of people started coming here. A lot of Chaldeans went to Michigan first, mm -hmm. and that's where the majority of Chaldean Catholics are. But San Diego mm -hmm. is the second largest Chaldean population. And so just like it happened in the villages where the people, they would stay together because they're minorities in the big country, right? So they're a minority with their religion, which is the most important thing to them. So they would stay together. So they would form communities. So that's what happened in the diaspora as well, like in Michigan, San Diego, Arizona. The people moved together. They lived together. They started to buy homes near each other. And then the church followed that. So the church would send priests from Iraq, the patriarch who... So in case people don't know, the Chaldean church is fully in union with the Catholic church. However, we have a patriarch like the Orthodox churches who is the head of the Chaldean church, but still under the authority of the Pope. Uh, so it's one of the 23 Eastern Rite Catholic churches. And so they would send clergy to America, and then the church was formed eventually, and I grew up as part of that church community. In San Diego. Yeah. yeah. So I have another question about the Saddam Hussein, though, and, mm -hmm. and, and Iraq, because I think a lot of people, we have this, you know, especially Americans, we have this kind of view of things happening in the Middle East, and you know, we're maybe informed by news media mm -hmm. and narratives and everything else. But, you know, Saddam Hussein was a brutal dictator, mm -hmm. but it sounds like he permitted enough freedom of religion that Christians could live there mm -hmm. and create True. communities, right? right. Uh, he falls. All of these revolutionaries are vying for power, like you said, and many of these religious sects, even within Islam, right? The Sunnis and the Shiites, mm -hmm. my understanding is, like, at war with each other. Yep. You know, that was big in Iran, too, or is still a thing. Mm -hmm. um, but how do, how do Christians get impacted by all of this and and do you have any kind of perspectives or opinions on the best way for christians to even live in the mm -hmm. middle east at this yeah, stage yeah. At, you know with all of the 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 factions and all mm -hmm. of the the conflicts that are ongoing yeah so christians are the most vulnerable group there and one of the reasons for that is because we don't have our own armies to mm -hmm. fight for us over there which obviously is because of jesus right Jesus was the one that that did not allow his apostles to use the sword. He came to bring peace in this world. And so Christians obviously are a people of peace. So we don't have armies to defend us besides smaller groups maybe that rise up to try to do that. But they would be nothing in comparison to the armies of these nations or to these revolutionary groups that started. For example, ISIS the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, Islamic State. And so they were, they were purposely targeting Christians. So what happened? Why? Well, because they wanted to start the Islamic State and they want either everybody to convert to Islam or to abide by the Sharia Allah. No infidels allowed. No, yeah. no, not, not there. So, so that's why actually, for example, they 
in one night in 2014, they went to Mosul and to the villages surrounding it where a lot of Chaldean people are, a lot of relatives of people that are um, here in San Diego, a lot of actually people that immigrated here were there and had their homes invaded by ISIS members. And one of the things that they did is, well, first of all, they gave them three options, which is you either leave, you either um, abide by the laws and pay a, an, an, an incredibly unjust tax, which nobody would be able to afford, or uh, you, you, you be killed if you don't convert to Islam. And so obviously the people, they barely had any opportunity to take just a few belongings and they took them and they just left the villages. And thank God we had um, a city called Erbil, which is in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. And uh, a lot of the people went there and the diocese there really did a great job of housing these people. But they valued their faith more than anything. And they were not going to deny their faith in Jesus. And so even though they didn't have homes, they they left. ISIS went in their homes and they went in the churches. And I saw this when I went there, like I said, for the first time in 2019, which is after ISIS was defeated, I saw a bunch of graffiti and I don't read Arabic well, so I couldn't read the graffiti, but I asked my bishop who uh, took me there, Bishop Emmanuel Shalita, and he said, this says property of ISIS. And it was in the Christian homes and it was in the churches. I would even go to some of the churches and just a devastating thing, you see uh, bullet marks in the walls on the altar area. And you see icons that were in the walls, stone icons, and the faces of Jesus and of Mary and of the saints were, were desecrated. They were, they were taken out. And so this is something that the people endured. And it obviously made their faith stronger mm -hmm. in Jesus. And it made us also realize the great benefits and the great freedom that we have to worship our faith. And I think it has to make our faith stronger as well to see their witness. Love your neighbor. It's a command that's been given to us. And for hundreds of years, loving your neighbor through health care was an important part of living out your faith. In fact, health care in general was done by neighbors coming together to support each other and ensure that each other's needs are met. This is one of the reasons that I love Crowd Health. Instead of relying on an insurance company who may or may not pay for the bill, Crowd Health allows you to crowdfund so that your neighbors that you are in a community with can help fund those bills. What's amazing is that Crowd Health has funded over 5,000 medical bills in just the last two years. Crowd Health is your solution to the insurance companies and the big pharma companies that have created so much dissatisfaction in the healthcare world. The Crowd Health service team is there for you to help you with your medical bills, help negotiate the best deal with the service provider, and then help you crowdfund through the community to ensure that your bills get covered. Take, for example, a young woman in Tennessee who was 19 years old and who lost her fingers in a tragic boating accident. Crowd Health got the medical bills, negotiated them, and then went to the funding community. Her bills were completely covered by the Crowd Health funding community. Whether it's accidents like this one, everything from babies in NICU to brain tumors, the Crowd Health community is designed to support your neighbor when they are in need. What's so powerful about this healthcare is that it's done voluntarily through the principle of loving one's neighbor by all of the people who are bought into the system. Keep in mind, crowd health is not insurance. It's a system to better love your neighbor and experience a community in helping you with your health care. Learn more at joincrowdhealth.com. That's joincrowdhealth.com. And if you sign up today using the code Lila, you'll get your first three months for only $99. Joincrowdhealth.com. Use the code Lila to get your first three months for only $99. So when your parents came, this was before, you know, this was before Saddam Hussein's fall. Right. And they're here. Um, and then in, over the last, can you give, would you be willing to give our listeners a quick history on what the last, let's say, 40 years, you know, after Saddam mm -hmm. Hussein's fall all the way to Ar the Iraq of today, what, what, what the movements were? Because obviously the U.S. got involved at, yeah. at a certain point and invaded and... Uh, yeah, yeah. Um I'm not entirely sure okay. about all of the specifics. I don't want to. I don't want to give any wrong information. But but what I do know is mm -hmm. the main group, um, Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda. They rose up and they were a revolutionary group, mm -hmm. and they were the ones that actually they had a lot of power after Saddam Hussein fell, and they were the ones that actually killed 
some of the Chaldean clergy. They became martyrs. There was um, a sister as well, Sister Cecilia, and a priest named Father Hrugid, a bishop, Archbishop uh, Polos Farajrahu. They were killed by Al-Qaeda. And so they were the big, powerful group at the time until ISIS came and started taking over. So when you were growing up as a little boy in San Diego, were you hearing the stories of the Chaldean Catholics of the Middle East as a child? What was, yes. what was your upbringing like? Yeah, we would definitely hear the stories. A lot of my relatives, you know, even my extended family ended up leaving because, like I said, they would follow each other. So it was just very sad. It was a, you know, you know, devastating thing to see and to hear about them not even being able to worship and like a priest, like I mentioned, Father Raghit, the, the Muslim extremists, they were trying to force him to close his church. And he said, how can I close the house of God? I'm here to serve the people and to give them Jesus. And that's, that's my duty. And even if I have to die doing that, I will, you know, this is what I've been called to do. And so that ended up being the, um, what happened to him is that he was killed. Along he was with, killed because he refused to close yeah, his church. Yeah, along with three deacons as well. What and is they just murdered murdered them in the night? They were they were on their way out of church. They were driving together, and he, they were stopped in the middle of the street. And then they were you know given the ultimatum to either convert or not. And when they they denied that, they you know kept strong in their faith in Jesus. And so they were just shot in the street, and their bodies were left there for many hours until people heard about it. And it's just a very sad thing to see. And so me growing up, you know, like I said earlier, our faith has to be strengthened by those stories. And so I would realize like, I need to take my faith very seriously because of these people. I need to pray for them, first of all, but I was also very inspired by their mm -hmm. faith in Jesus. And I would think like, I have all these freedoms over here. I need to go take advantage of these gifts that, that God has given me, this access I have to the Eucharist, to the sacraments, to my church community. And so growing up, I was very close to church. My dad is a deacon. And so he would teach my sisters and I a lot about the faith and we would pray together. And I was an altar boy growing up. And from the first moments of my high school time, I, I became a, a catechism teacher for the kids. And so I just love to teach and to spread the faith. And it was in high school, in my sophomore year, I moved to a public school. Before that, I was just going to a Catholic school all my life. And so it was a very different experience for me to go there, first of all, as a Chaldean, but also as a Catholic in that um, environment, which I was not used to seeing so many people that disagreed with my belief. I was used to being surrounded by faithful Catholic people. So I got really challenged in, in my faith as well, because I would even have moments where I would be embarrassed to share my faith, but thank God that he gave me the grace to persevere and to, he just lit a fire in me to spread his word and to help others understand his message. When did you first feel, Father Simon, God calling you to be a priest? The first initial feeling was probably when I was like six or seven years old, actually. I just had such an admiration for the priest of my church. There's only one priest serving a huge Chaldean community at the time. His name is Father Michael Bazi. So I had a great admiration for him. And as I grew up, I was so involved in the church and I would just ask myself the question. I would say, you know, he was a little bit older. I would say after he's gone, he's the only priest here serving the Chaldean church. After he's gone, who's going to do it? Mm -hmm. So I would think about that. And so that was kind of the seed of my vocation. And that mixed with the Catholic foundation that I had at home. When I went to high school, I kind of drifted away from that because of the temptations and the, you know, just, just being a teenager, it was tough at the time, but thank God I came back to the church and was very faithful to Jesus. And so it was late high school when I really started to take it very seriously. And then I ended up joining the seminary right after high school. What would be, what do you think your parents did? What are the top two or three things mm. that your parents did right to help foster your love for Jesus? Great question. One thing that they did is they were very 
close to us, my, to me and my sisters. They were very personal with us. They, they were, they made it very comfortable for us to talk to them and to be open to them. And so there was a lot of times where they would teach us about the faith. So it, it wasn't only from church classes that I learned. I mean, I would go in there basically knowing all the basics of the faith and it was because of the upbringing at home, but Equally or even more important was not only learning about the faith, but it, it was praying together as, as a family at home. And from the earliest times, I remember every single night we would pray the rosary together, no matter what. The whole, and, the whole rosary. The whole rosary. Even and the, when you were a little itty bitty. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And the whole family had to be there <laughs> no matter what. I, I remember a time, I'm a big baseball fan. And so I was watching the Padres game and... Baseball fans know how extra innings work. You know, they just... Are you a Dodgers fan? Hopefully not. I mean, not. I, I, I moonlight <laughs> as a some interest in sports. This is a good time to be a Padres fan. I'm a, definitely a Padres yes, fan. Yes, there we go. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> and you want me to be father their, for today. <laughs> their, um, their mascot is a, is a friar. And they're oh, called the Fathers. We're Padres you know? fans. Yeah. Hug, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so I was watching a Padres game. I still... Like, this is one of my core memories. Mm -hmm. I don't know how old I was, 12, 13. I was watching the Padres game. It's a very intense game. They're in the playoff race, extra innings, and the game is just going, and it's just not not ending. And so my dad kept on telling me, like, look, it's time to come and pray the rosary. And I kept on telling him, like, you know, give me another couple minutes to the point where he just came and said, because it just wasn't ending and, you know, everybody had to sleep. And he said, you have to come. So I remember turning off the TV and going and praying the rosary. And even though my mind was on the Padres game during the rosary, I learned the importance of prayer, that prayer is the most important thing in, in, in a person's life because it's about your connection with God. And if you don't have prayer, then there's no spirituality and there's no life in your soul. And so my parents formed that in me and they really helped me to grow up as a, as a Christian, as a, as a Catholic with a relationship with Jesus. And it was the communal aspect of the church as a family that had a great impact on me growing up. And it was because of that, that I had the opportunity to go and to start having a personal relationship with Jesus flourish. So that's when I would go because most of the time my prayer was with my family or with the church community, but then I would go and I would start to read the Bible by myself mm -hmm. and I would really increase in my personal relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what really helped my faith flourish. How many siblings? I have two sisters. One is my twin sister. Oh, how fun yeah. is that? Oh my it goodness. was, uh, it was pretty boring as a child. I, would, <laughs> I just, uh, we'd get mad that we have to share birthdays, you know, but, but, uh, I love her and we have a great relationship. How did your parents respond when they, when they learned that you were felt called to the priesthood? My dad is a deacon and he really supported it from the beginning, even though he did have a IT technology business at the time. And it was kind of the plan that I was going to study that and take over it. But he was very happy about it. My mom was also happy about it. She was just shocked because I was 17 and I told her like a month before I was going to leave the house and join the seminary. So <laughs> she was very shocked that it was that fast. She thought I would wait until after college and stuff, but then she ended up coming around at the time and, uh, and, and, and they both really support me. So are you serving father at the church that as a little boy, you wondered what would happen to the priest? I served there for my first two years as, as a priest, but then thank God, I mean, that was the only church at the mm -hmm. time in San Diego, the only Chaldean church. Wow. So I'm serving at the second Chaldean church that, that was established. I'm the pastor of St. Michael Chaldean church. And now we actually have four Chaldean churches in San Diego. And is that because the Chaldean Catholic community is growing there? There's more children or is it because of immigration? Why, how, why it's is both. it growing? It's both. There's, there's a lot of children, a lot of young Chaldean Catholic families and immigration as well, especially from the time of ISIS. A, a lot of people came here. What does it mean? You kind of were describing it earlier, how it's under Rome, uh -huh. you know, but they have their own patriarch, like the Orthodox do, although the Orthodox are not under mm -hmm. Rome. Can you just explain it a little yeah, more yeah, to people? Yeah, for sure. Because I think people here or they encounter the Chaldean right as an example, and they, mm -hmm. you know, it's interesting mm -hmm. and, and it seems, you know, beautiful. But I think there's a lot of these different rites and you know different yeah. patriarch, but then there's the bishop, mm -hmm. and so break it down for people. So I'll just say something very short, and then I'll explain a little more. But the short statement is: it's the same faith, but a different way of expressing it. 
And the way that we express the same faith, like we believe in the creed, we believe in the sacraments, we are fully Catholic. The different ways that we express the faith are in our liturgy. Although the general structure of the liturgy is the same, like we have a liturgy of the Word at the beginning and then the liturgy of the Eucharist, we have a different way of uh, praying in a certain sense. We have different prayers. We have our own church fathers. I'm sure people have heard of St. Ephraim. He was um, part of what was called at the time the Church of the East, which had also what's now the Assyrian Church of the East, who they are like Orthodox. So they're our sister church. Hopefully one day they, uh, we can be united. But they have a patriarch who's separate from the Chaldean patriarch, and he's not under the Pope. Our patriarch is under the authority of the Pope. So we have what's called a synod of bishops that meets every year, and they're basically the the uh, law system of, of our church. So different prayers, obviously our language is different. Like we have no Latin mass ever. We've never had, we've had Aramaic mass. And not to say anything about the Latin mass, but our mass is older. <laughs> it's much older. Our You're like, we're the true trads. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, really. Our liturgy, our Eucharistic prayer, mm -hmm. anaphora, goes back to Edde and Mari, who were disciples of St. Thomas and probably part of the 72, if not one of them was part of the 12 apostles, Edde, who is, might be considered St. Jude Thaddeus. So they wrote our first liturgy. So it goes back to apostolic times. And the first ever church building was in a region in a city called Koche, which means slums in Aramaic. And that was in Mesopotamia. That's the first ever church building. Wow. So it's a very, very ancient what year, people. What year was that? It, it was in the in the first century for sure, like like late first century, 80s maybe. So were they able 70s, to... 70s, 80s. Were the, those early Christians, just a few decades after Christ's death and resurrection, were those early Christians in the position to be able to build those Chaldean Christians, build that first church because there wasn't persecution of them in the in the region? Or how were they able to do question. that? That's a good question. Because you had the catacombs, you had the underground church yeah, yeah. in the Roman Empire and mm -hmm. all the persecutions that would come, you know, intermittently. Yeah. What I think is that they would be gathering in the homes mm -hmm. and I just think it got too big for them to gather in homes. Like the, the, the communities were too big. And so they did start to mm -hmm. build church buildings until the persecution really, mm -hmm. you know, you know, started. And, uh, so why, how did, how is it that the Chaldean church remained under Rome, but the Orthodox church didn't? Yeah. So let's just speak in terms of the Chaldean and Assyrian church, because like I said, the Assyrian church is like the Orthodox church. It's very similar in their liturgy and in the fact that they just have a patriarch there was a schism. There was a split. Actually, the Chaldean church was not part of the Catholic church officially. Mm. But some historians would, would say that we never made an act of separation, which I believe is true. Like we never actually made an act of separation from the Catholic church or you from Rome. We were just Rome. living the we faith over in, here in while that, Rome was, exactly. you know, the, the patriarch of Rome was doing yeah, the faith over here. Exactly. And so, there was no cell phone. There's no email. There's no phone calls, all that stuff. So... so. Yeah. Things wouldn't get their information and, and all that stuff, but we we had the same faith, and there was a split, and the Assyrian Church now is still not part of the of the Catholic Church, although there have been movements in the past and even a little bit now to try to unite our churches. We hope that one day it will happen because our faith is very similar. Like I was just at a mass. There's one Assyrian church in San Diego. And so I was just at a mass. Their patriarch, Mar Awa, came to visit San Diego. And so the Chaldean bishop, Mar Emmanuel Shalita, and a, and a couple of priests and I, we went to go visit there. And so we went to their, their liturgy and then we had dinner with them after. So it was, it was nice. Usually there's not that much like, interaction. Just kiss the Pope's ring. Come on, guys. I, <laughs> we were talking about that there actually with the priest. Like that's the last step. And what's the, what's the hesitation, do you think? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but what I tell them when I talk to them sometimes is that the Vatican is very good with us. Like they're not very authoritative over the, the Chaldean church. They have a great respect for the patriarchs and they really only deal with us in two things, which is 
they approve the final liturgical texts, which I think is very important. You know, it's good to not have the freedom to just go and change liturgy anytime you want. And the Pope will choose any new bishops. And he'll take the recommendation of the Patriarch and the Synod. But other than that, we are, you know, we are free. And it's it's cool because we are still members of the Catholic Church. And I think that that's what makes the Catholic Church like the formula for the unity of all Christians. Amen. Is because you can come and you can keep your liturgy, you can keep your traditions, you can keep your language, you can keep your customs, but you're still part of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's a beautiful thing for us, Chaldean Catholics. And even, like you said, a lot of your listeners don't know a lot about the Chaldean Church. Even a lot of Chaldeans don't really know a lot about it. And one of the reasons for that is because most of the texts that we have about our saints and our church fathers and our liturgy, most of them are in Aramaic, and our youth here are not really growing up speaking Aramaic. So that's why we have English masses. We have times that, uh, you know, we have prayer services where we teach the people about these things. We have new prayer books. So we're really trying to preserve the Chaldean heritage. I would call it like a flavor of Catholicism. It's a it's the same faith, different flavor. And we're trying to teach our people that so that they are inspired by the faith of our martyrs and our church fathers. But the combination or the, 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 the thread that holds you together is your shared history and your ethnicity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is Definitely. an ethnicity yes, and yes. a common language uh -huh. and to some degree, probably common customs. Mm -hmm. Although now that you're Americanized, how does that look? We're how proud Chaldean Americans. Yeah. Okay. Very, very proud American Chaldean flag. Americans. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. Always. And just one thing on that note about the ISIS time. I remember hearing from people at the time, there's a lot of factions and divisions even within the Chaldeans and Assyrians and the Syriacs, right? Like different villages and which name are we going to be called? But I remember hearing from people at the time that when ISIS came, they didn't come and say, are you Chaldean? Are you Assyrian? Are you Syriac? Are you from this village or that village? No, they were looking for Christians and they united themselves according to that. They Their main identity was to be followers of Jesus. And that is at the core of the Chaldean identity mm -hmm. now is that we are we are Christians, we are Catholics, members of the Catholic Church, and that is the main mm -hmm. uh, reason for our lives is to spread the word of Jesus and to be members of His Church. Amen. Why do you think that the obedience to Jesus, but through Rome? matters. Mm -hmm. And we talk about this sometimes on the podcast, but increasingly I'm having more priests on the show. It just I know, is happening. You're... I'm like becoming I'm the, like priest, the fourth one in, the in, priest a, in a week. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm like, okay, the it's audience cool. is along for the ride. It's Thank cool. you guys. Um, but we have Protestants listening. Uh -huh. We have non-Catholics and non-Christians listening. We have Catholics, of course, listening. We have like, we don't have just, this is not just like the Catholic show. Yeah. Even though I'm having all the, all these amazing priests on but I think this question kind of bubbles to the surface sometimes of why does it matter so much? If we, if, if, we're, if anyone who loves Jesus, if we're called by, you know, we, we, we profess the name of Jesus, we're trying to serve the Lord Jesus, you know, we, mm -hmm. we try to live by largely speaking biblical truth and values. And I'm asking this a bit rhetorically because I have my own answer, but I want okay, your answer. Cool. You, particularly because of your history, your family history, and your own faith, you know, you have this personal relationship with our Lord, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're a priest in the Chaldean, right? Why does it matter so much for you to be under the mm -hmm. Roman Catholic mm -hmm. Church as opposed to independent or maybe right. connected to the Assyrians or the Orthodox <clears throat> right, right. or Protestant, like do your own thing, like mm -hmm. have, make it your own church. Why does it matter so much? Yeah. The church is the body of Christ and Jesus wanted everybody to experience not only him in a spiritual sense, but to experience his body as well. So Jesus came and walked around this world and he lived here for 33 years. For only three of those years, he was actually serving. And uh, I mean, he was doing his public ministry at the time. And then he went up to heaven after he died and rose. It wasn't that he completed his ministry or his work of salvation for us. And it wasn't that only the people at the time had the opportunity to encounter his presence, his real physical presence, but he meant it for all time. So that's why at the Last Supper, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them. And he said, do this in memory of me. And I think that, that there's an interpretation of something that I always think about very deeply around Easter time, because 
we preach on this on the Gospel of John's account and Mary Magdalene's encounter with Jesus about how she wanted to hold him. Mm -hmm. She wanted to, you know, he said, don't touch me. Really, don't he said, don't hold me. on to me. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a simple explanation to that is that he was gone and she wanted to hold on to him. She didn't want him to leave, but he said, don't hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to my father. Because when he ascends to his father, he's going to be not only available for her in a physical way, but for the whole world through the Holy Spirit, through the power that he gives to the church. And so, you know, I was just with uh, Ruslan. You were there too, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's great. And he's so awesome. And it was kind of funny how we were talking mm -hmm. and he was interviewing me, but there was only one question that I asked him, <laughs> which is... Why aren't you Catholic? <laughs> <laughs> we spoke about that, but um, we're talking about the Eucharist. Mm. And about the real presence. And he said, he and uh, Zach, his co-host, they said, yeah, I was actually pretty shocked to hear. They said, we believe in the, in, in the real presence. And I was shocked at that. I said, why do you believe in the real presence in the Eucharist? Like what makes yours the Eucharist? And what's the difference between that and ours? And the conversation led to me telling them that I don't believe that theirs is the Eucharist. <laughs> and the reason for that is because they're not part of the apostolic church. Their, their pastors are not ordained priests that have a direct connection to the apostles and which means to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And Jesus had a hierarchy for his apostles, right? For his disciples, he had 72 disciples, 12 apostles, three more important ones, Peter, James, and John, and then one most important one who is St. Peter, who he gave the keys of the kingdom to and mm -hmm. said, uh, you have the power to loose and to bind on, on earth as, as in heaven. And so I think Jesus gave us the formula for the unity of all mm -hmm. Christians, which is the apostles under Peter. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. The Pope. <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> but I think there's also, I, I think there's confusion too, even about the Orthodox tradition because, you know, there was, as you said, the schism, the mm -hmm. split yeah, and the Orthodox priests, you know, they are in the line of the apostles, mm -hmm. in the oh, line yeah. of St. Peter. And Definitely. so they do have the power to consecrate. Yeah. 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 We that, believe in their Eucharist. We believe in their Eucharist uh -huh. is Jesus, mm -hmm. but my understanding is it's valid, but it's not licit. Yeah. It's not lawful in the sense that they are not under They're Rome. not in the full unity. Yeah. So, of course, the priest still has that power mm -hmm. through his ordination, mm -hmm. the gift of his ordination. Right. But they're just not fully in line with yeah. Rome. Good Ranchers delivers some of the best beef, poultry, and pork directly to your door, directly from farmers and ranchers in the United States. I love Good Ranchers because it's American meat delivered and the meat is delicious, especially the chicken. I love the chicken breasts. Goodranchers.com has an amazing promotion going on right now where if you sign up for a subscription box and you use the code Lila, you get $25 off your box, you get free fast shipping, and you get to add on a free delicious product of chicken breast, bacon, ground beef, or salmon. So go to GoodRanchers.com today, support your local ranchers, and partner with a company that supports your pro-life and pro-family values. And use the code LILA at checkout for $25 off your first subscription order, in addition to free shipping and your choice of ground beef, chicken breast, those are my favorite, salmon or bacon. Go to GoodRanchers.com today and enjoy delicious American meat delivered. Do you think that there will be a day when... We'll all be under one family again. I definitely hope so. I, I mean... All the churches. And I don't just mean like the Orthodox and you mentioned the Assyrians, but I mean all the evangelicals and the denominations, like the Lutherans and the mm -hmm. Presbyterians and the Anglicans. Yeah. Like when are we all going to be together under one head? Yeah, we got to keep working towards that with love and with humility and with respect while also not denying what we believe. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important in, in the work for that um, ecumenical you know, spirit. We have to make sure that we don't deny what we believe, but that we hold firm and that we explain it. That First of all, we know it well, everything mm -hmm. that we believe so that we can explain it well. And th that's an opportunity for evangelization as well. If we believe strongly about the teachings of the church and of the Bible, and we show people how they are biblical, I mean, the Bible is our source of God's uh, revelation for the whole world, right? And especially for all Christians, because they all believe in it. And so if we just keep on focusing on the scriptures and 
teaching people about the teachings of the church, like, you know, the assumption was yesterday, you know, okay, it's not explicitly mentioned in the Bible, but, you know, if we have relationships with people, we can have longer conversations mm -hmm. so we can show them it's not just about proof texts. It's about delving deep in, into the word of God and understanding the story of salvation, which ends in the church being the one that will, the, the institution and the home that will get us to heaven. Hmm. What's been the hardest part of your priesthood, Father? That's a good question. All great questions. Um, hardest part of my priesthood, I'll tell you just an experience that happens more often than, than I would like for sure. I would never want this to happen, but it's really hard to experience when you grow up, like when a kid grows up in church and let's say like you baptize the kid. I mean, I've been a priest just over nine and a half years. So some kids that I baptized are, you know, eight or nine years old now. It's very hard to see a young person who is involved in the church and to see them be led astray mm -hmm. and to see them leave the church and to live a life outside of the teachings of Jesus and of the Bible and of the faith and there not being anything that you could do. Right. So, I mean, we can do a lot as priests. We have a great power that has been given to us by Jesus to perform the sacraments. But that's a sad, hard part. And it's a reality of the priesthood that, I mean, we just have to keep on doing our best to bring people to him, go out and get people, be fishers of men. But that's a very hard part. I mean, ultimately, it's not in our control. It's, it's in God's hands and God allows people to make decisions. We have to do our best to give them the nourishment, the spiritual nourishment that they need. Is that why you started your TikTok account? Yeah. I mean, it was at the time of the COVID lockdowns and people were really scared and they weren't coming to church often. And so I was actually talking to my little cousin and she showed me a video on TikTok, which was a pastor or something talking. And I said, what platform is that on? Because I'd never seen it. I, I mean, I had seen some TikTok videos, but it was unrecognizable to me because I thought it was only about like dancing and stuff, you know, because it used to be called musically. Dance? No, Come on, father. <laughs> actually, I, I, I grew up kind of shy. And so there's very beautiful Chaldean traditional mm -hmm. dances, like in a, that in a circle. Viral. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, I just never really learned uh, how to dance like that. But, um, so my cousin told me that, so she showed me videos of Catholic and Christian content on the app. Not really Catholic. There's barely any Catholic content. So I said, we got to get the message out to people. We have to reach people where they are. And so I started doing that. And among other things, which is that we, me and the Chaldean priests that serve with me, we have great ministries, you know, physical interactions with people as well as social media ministries. One of the, my favorite ministries actually, and I started this when I was in high school. I called it Youth for Truth. Mm. I would gather with some of my friends and it it ended up being almost every Chaldean at the school would gather once a week and do like a Bible study and have pizza uh, during lunch. And it kind of stopped after I graduated high school. And, and I told some youth about that a few years ago and they were inspired by it. And so now a couple of priests and I actually help them and we go to five or six different high schools every every week and we do a Bible study and take pizza. Amazing. It's cool. Yeah. Uh, what kind of fruit do you see from your ministry among especially younger people? There is, you know, two narratives, I guess. Mm -hmm. One is that, oh, America's youth are in trouble. Mm. They're all going crazy. Uh, they're so confused uh, on politics and morality. Um, there's so much woundedness, mental health, suicidation, mm -hmm. suicide ide ideation and suicide, mm -hmm. you know, suicide attempts. Like it's just a mess right there out there for mm -hmm. young people, especially Gen Z, many Gen and now Gen right. Alpha. And then I hear and I see personally conversion mm -hmm. and all of these strong young people who are fighting for family mm -hmm. and life and who are passionate about their faith and, you know, bucking. And now it's in a way, it's almost a rebellious thing to live a moral mm -hmm. life in service of Christ right. instead of living the way the culture recommends. What do you see? I mean, you, you said you go to five different high schools yeah. in San Diego a week. Yeah, what are you yeah. seeing? I see people and youth on fire for their faith and they just want to learn they want to receive the sacraments. I mean, you should see our confession lines are are crazy at our churches. In and San Diego. In San Diego, yeah, Chaldean churches. And so many youth, young people. I have a group of 
many altar servers between 40 and 50, sometimes even more, that come to daily Mass, actually. And they serve daily Mass, and we do the prayers of the Chaldean liturgy in English. We chant them. It's a very, very beautiful thing to see. And one of the reasons for that, one of the ways that it started, it's a cool story because I, you know, I mentioned I'm a big uh, Padres fan, and I love sports. I love to play basketball. And one of my friends, he called me one day. He said, I have this really nice basketball hoop, but I don't need it anymore. So he said, do you want it? I said, yeah, bring it to the church. And so we set it up in the church. And at the same time, I started an evening daily mass mm -hmm. in English because we only had one daily mass. It was just in Chaldean, Aramaic at, at, at my church in the morning. So I started that mass and kids would come and play basketball at the church. And I would just go up to them and I'd say, guys, you can come play whenever you want. I just have one rule. Don't play during mass. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really intend for this to happen, but one by one, they started coming to Mass. And then they started to serve the Mass. And then now it's this this big group. And Do they play after Mass? Oh, yeah. yeah, With yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, have, I have more fun than most of them probably, you know. But I think that's one of the great things about my ministry. One of the things that I'm seeing is the closeness of people to the church community. Is that it's not just ideas for them, but they are actually encountering Jesus in the sacraments. And we go out and get them, like we go to the high schools, we post online, right? But the most important thing is not just to learn about Jesus, but is to encounter him, is to receive his body and to become Jesus. And so that's what I'm seeing a lot. Obviously, there are many struggles, but the relationship that we priests and that, you know, Catholic leaders like you have with the people is something that is really nourishing their faith and um, helping them grow. What do you recommend? What's your advice for someone listening who maybe is hungry for that, but when they show up at their local parish, mm. you know, or maybe they're evangelical and they've tried different churches and they just feel that they haven't found that community? Mm. Yeah. It's tough, um, especially when it's not really possible for you to just go and keep looking, right? Like I really feel for people who don't feel the sense of community with other people. I would encourage them though to focus on Jesus and his love for them and the way that he wants to give himself to them, which is in humility and becoming vulnerable in the, in the, in the Eucharist, which he sacrificed for us. And the Eucharist is there no matter which language it's in, if you enjoy the mass or not, if you have fuzzy feelings during the Mass or not, if you enjoy the homily or not, right? The Eucharist is still there. It's still Jesus. And as hard as it is for some people who don't have the community, I would encourage them to persevere in their faith. That's what, that's what Jesus says. And that maybe God is calling them to be instruments of His grace for other people. Maybe He wants them to go and to experience Him so that He touches their hearts and so that they can help other people who have the same experiences as them. He can help other people get closer to him through their faith. I need to tell you about my favorite coffee company, Seven Weeks Coffee. Seven Weeks Coffee works directly with farmers using fair trade so that they can support farmers who are doing an amazing job growing the best beans in the world. All of Seven Weeks Coffee comes from the highest quality, one to 2% of all the coffee beans that are harvested. Seven Weeks Coffee is small batch roasted, low acid, and organic. You're going to love these coffee blends. They're some of my favorite. I love Ethiopia Medium. You can go on sevenweekscoffee.com and look at their light roast, their dark roast, their medium roast. You're going to find your favorite blend. But my favorite thing about Seven Weeks Coffee, besides a delicious cup of coffee, is that 10% of all of the revenue of the company, not just the profits, 10% of Seven Weeks Coffee revenue goes directly to support the pro-life movement. 10% of all their sales go to pregnancy resource centers to provide material free help to moms and babies in need. So when you go to sevenweekscoffee.com, you join their subscription where you get your monthly subscription of coffee. You know that 10% of all of that sale is going directly to support moms and babies in need. Plus you're getting an amazing and delicious cup of coffee through sevenweekscoffee.com. So go to sevenweekscoffee.com today, Use the code Lila at checkout. You, if you do that and you sign up for the Heartbeat Club, you will become a monthly member and you will get up to 25% off your first order and know that part of what you're doing when you drink your coffee every morning is supporting moms and babies in need. In fact, 
Seven Weeks Coffee has almost hit their milestone of donating over half of a million dollars to pregnancy resource centers, and you helped make that happen. So thank you and continue to support sevenweekscoffee.com and drink this delicious coffee by going there today and ordering your next coffee bundle. Go to sevenweekscoffee.com today, use the code Lila at checkout, and enjoy your delicious coffee. Be the community. Yeah. And love Jesus a lot mm -hmm. and let him love yeah. you. That's so yeah. good. What do you, when you became a priest and you said nine years now yeah. of being a priest, what's been the most surprising thing about Ooh. being a priest? Deep questions today. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I love them. No, no, no. I love it. You're like, uh, we just do TikTok videos in the Padres <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. cooking, right? You do TikTok videos and cooking? Yeah, well, not, no, I don't cook. I, I do eat. food Sorry. reviews sometimes. You do yeah. food reviews. Yeah. <laughs> Um, most surprising thing. Um, I don't know. I, I didn't know how much, <laughs> I didn't know how much I would enjoy it. Let's just say, okay. Because in my discernment, I was thinking about the sacrificial aspect of it. I'm going to have to sacrifice having a wife and kids and I'm giving my life to be with Jesus and to walk with him and to, you know, be a priest in the church and to sacrifice my life for the good of souls. But I, I didn't know how much I would enjoy it. And it's a very beautiful thing. Like, and I, I think it's the same thing with like a father of a family. Yes, mm -hmm. there's a big sacrificial aspect to it. You have to sacrifice, you have to go to work, you know, you have to be there for your wife and kids and uh, be a virtuous person. And that takes a lot of work, but the more you put into it, the more you're going to actually enjoy it being with, with your family and being that person that's there for them rather than, if a man were to give in to his desires and go hang out with his friends all the time, or, you know, give in to his lustful passions or stuff like that, he's going to be just satisfying a desire in himself, a temporary desire, but he's not going to be fulfilling who he is called to be as a man. But the more you do that, the more you fulfill your vocation, what God has called you to do, the more God actually wants you to enjoy it. And so I thought I'm going to be giving up wife and kids, but God actually fulfilled those desires in me, you know, um, in a way that, that I, I could have never imagined. Um, and so that was very surprising and very joyful. There is a advice I heard about a priest saying one time, I think about how to discern whether or not you have a religious vocation. So this could work for women, but it's mostly for men considering the priesthood, but women can have a religious vocation, obviously to, mm -hmm. you know, be a nun or be sure. a sister. And he was saying that, if if you, if it's impossible to imagine life without a family like marriage kids like it's like kills you like waking up in a bed alone mm -hmm. each morning you know and knowing okay this is me you know I'm I have a community of people in my household maybe but I don't have a spouse I don't mm -hmm. have kids biological kids or adopted kids in that way but if you can imagine you may maybe imagine and be like yeah that would be maybe tough sometimes but I think I can do it mm -hmm. that's sometimes a a clue for yeah, you might have a vocation, yeah. but if it's like, I can't even imagine that, that would kill mm. me, it's so painful, then maybe you don't have a vocation and you don't have to torment yourself. Because right. I think a lot of really faithful young Catholics, I have seen anyways, they just torment themselves sometimes uh -huh. about what is God calling me to? I'm going to go discern at this religious order or this priest or this, because mm. they really want to give themselves to God, mm. which is beautiful. They're very wholehearted. They want to give themselves to God. But part of our vocation, yeah, it's sacrifice, but it's also it's also joy and peace, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. I mean, what, Definitely. what advice do you have for people discerning their vocation? Yeah, I would say, first of all, don't force it, right? Just yeah. like you mentioned, don't force something that's not there. The Bible talks about that we have to accept the different gifts that God has given us, the gifts of the Spirit. Jesus says when he's talking about eunuchs for the kingdom, he says, let he who is willing to accept it, accept it, right? So there there has to be a desire. What does that mean, Unix for the kingdom? Unix for the kingdom, it means uh, people who have dedicated themselves to celibacy for the sake of the kingdom. So Jesus wasn't talking about people who are actually castrated. He was no, talking yeah, about people that's who a, that's chose a good celibacy. Point. Yes, definitely. So I think sometimes people get there's yeah. confusion about that. Right? Yes, yeah, yeah, definitely. So it's the people that have the desire for that. St. Saint, Saint John Paul II mm -hmm. talks about that in the theology of the body in a, in a beautiful way. It's about the people that have the desire for that, but also God could be placing a desire in your heart to serve, and it doesn't have to be necessarily in the priesthood. The church needs good people all over the world. And so my advice would be two things. 
like practically speaking, would be to seek like a spiritual father, spiritual director to guide you in the process, but ultimately to go to Jesus. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be given you. Go to Jesus, deepen your relationship with him. You know, there's that book, uh, Soul of the Apostolate, mm, one, one of my favorite books. Someone was just talking about that. On the oh podcast, yeah, Father right? Jason. Father Jason, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, hey, yeah. Maybe, yeah. They, we yeah, should, maybe we, that's why it's on my mind. We should do a book club, guys. What do you think? Uh, that is such an Soul incredible book. It, it had is. such a big impact on me and my ministry because the premise of the book mm -hmm. is if you want to minister well, go to Jesus more, you know, go pray more, go to mass, go to adoration. You know, a lot of the time I feel like when people discern, they just try to think, oh, what should I do? What should I do? Right? Go to Jesus and he's going to, bring you peace and he's going to show you like physically go to jesus physically go to can. jesus it is true yeah. i feel like my my biggest vocational moments defining moments like meeting and marrying my husband mm -hmm. and like getting over like all the chaos of dating in my 20s and figuring out like maybe i'm supposed to be consecrated yeah you know i don't know like a celibate yeah. or what, who knows but it was in adoration mm -hmm. and just opening your heart to jesus tell him everything yeah and just say do with me what you will like yeah, whatever yeah. you want lord you know and exactly. he's so generous he's so peaceful yeah, and generous with i know us. like how mother mary was you know mm -hmm. she she's the model of vocations because she was betrothed to joseph and she received a call from the angel and she she discerned the angel's call. There is actually a beautiful hymn from the Chaldean liturgy. This is just an example of the Chaldean spirituality, which I think it's good that it came to my mind to share with people. There was one of the church fathers of the Chaldean church. His name is Saint Narse, Mar Narse. He was around the time of Saint Ephraim. They like um, had encounters together, but he was one of the great church fathers of the Chaldean church. He wrote a hymn, which is kind of poetic about the Annunciation, which is a Chaldean style of theology, which was basically an exposition of the Bible passage where it takes the characters, like let's say there's a short dialogue in the Bible, and it takes the characters and it basically like expands their conversation to show theological points. Mm. And so the hymn is Mary and the angel Gabriel going back and forth with each other. That's there's cool. just a couple lines in the scripture, right? In the Annunciation passage. But the hymn of St. Narse is going back and forth a lot to show like what was on Mary's mind at the time. And he shows her questioning a lot about... What the, it means. Yeah, what it means about like why, like how can this be, right? That's that's what that's what Mary said. And one of the things that she says is, my mother Eve was deceived by a supernatural person, by a supernatural being. And so I, I, I want to make sure that I'm not being deceived because what you're telling me is unheard of, right? And so it's not until, obviously, like in the scripture, she hears the mention of the Holy Spirit, that it's going to be done by God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then in the gospel passage and in Mar Narse's account, there's no more questions afterwards. There's full mm -hmm. acceptance. So the point for discernment is she questioned. She didn't understand something. She said, how can this be since I have not known men? Or have you heard the thing, by the way, of the Mary being consecrated a virgin before that moment? I have heard Yeah, that. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's, it is crazy. Because Which is crazy that she would then be betrothed to Joseph. Yeah, it's very. It brings up a lot of questions. She was already consecrated to, as a virgin. So, there, yeah. for just for people listening, there's a, an, a, a, you know, a history, and we don't know if it's true. It's it's a it's a tradition mm. that Mary was consecrated by her, mm. you know, of her free will, but yeah. with her parent through her with her parents to be a virgin for mm. Jesus. And this was a thing. Like a lot of these young girls at the time, like that that was a thing to be consecrated. Mm -hmm. Like other, it wasn't just Mary, right? There were other right, girls right. that were consecrated, yeah. and she was consecrated, and then. She was betrothed to Joseph, but that was done culturally for protection of mm -hmm. her as she got older. Because there was the no convent for her, for her to go but join. But he would have respected her virginity, yeah. her consecration, mm -hmm. right? That was the That's the understanding. Yeah. So there was a law in the book of Numbers. Brent Petrie would quote this a lot better than me because he, he wrote a whole chapter of this in his book, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of Mary. One of the best books on Mary that I've read, by the way. And he quotes a, a law from the book of Numbers that was about that that was about the other spouse accepting a, a vow like that. And so he says that there is precedent for it, even mm -hmm. in the Old Testament. Basically and, a celibate marriage. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so the way to read Mary's question in that light is not, how are you going to make this happen, 
right? But no, it's how can this be since I do not know man? So it's the present tense word that is used there. It's a continuous word. Like that's what's implied. It's the, the question can be translated to what should I do? Like what am I going to do to accomplish this? Because I don't have plans to have intimate relations with a man. So are you telling me to do that or is there another way, right? So that's one way of reading it. I mean, it make, it kind of makes yeah. sense. Yeah, it does make sense. Because especially if she was a consecrated virgin and regardless, she was a virgin. Mm -hmm. You know, they, right. she hadn't consummated anything mm -hmm. with Joseph. If that, you know, I know some Protestants believe, well, she went on and had yeah. kids. But, you know, obviously we believe in the in the virginity mm -hmm. of Mary beyond even yeah. the birth of Jesus. But yeah, it, it makes sense. It's like, yeah. how is this going to happen, guys? Yeah. Like yeah. she didn't assume that it would be through the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, who would assume that? Yeah, know? yeah, who would? <laughs> yeah, right? And so that's when the angel explains to her, like, look, you don't have to go and do that. We're going to, God is going to take care of it in a miraculous way. And then that's when Mary says, behold, I'm the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. So it was a passive acceptance of God's will. It was her uniting her will to God's will. And that's what answering the uh, vocational call is. Like how Mary responded to that. She questioned, she discerned, and she accepted actively. You know, she, she accepted God's will in her life and she made herself to be an instrument or the handmaid of the Lord. I love that she was she was receptive, but she was passively she was active, receptive, yeah, actively like weird, passive, yeah. you know. But I, but also later on, like she goes to the hill country to go uh -huh, see her cousin. Yeah, like she she's like first trimester pregnant. That's not easy, but she's go, like she takes Mary's a woman of action mm -hmm. as much as she's also a woman of meditation. Like mm -hmm. she's listening, right, she's receiving right. the word of the Lord, and and Saint Joseph is too. Yes. you know, Jesus speaks to him in dreams, but then he takes action. Like uh -huh. he he has to figure it out to protect Definitely. Jesus and Mary. And I, I love that the implication for our faith and especially for discernment, because Jesus wants us to ask. Mm -hmm. He wants us to ask. He wants us to, in a way, wrestle, like discuss. Right. But he wants us to be at peace. Yes, yeah. In the asking to yeah. know that it's already taken care of. But you're going to use your reason uh -huh. and your circumstances and 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 the graces I give you to navigate yeah, whatever yeah. the situation is. Yeah, you mentioned Saint Joseph, and it says that he had decided these things like to go to go to Egypt and those moves that he had to make to protect Jesus or um, just going back when he was confused we're not exactly sure what he thought of or what he heard from Mary about her pregnancy but it said that he decided something right he decided to he was a just to, man, yeah, yeah put her away quietly because he was a just man it said that he decided but he didn't make a move until the angel told him what to do. So he did the, the work of discernment and he decided something. God didn't want him to do that. And so it's, it's like he was so much at peace and in unity with God that even in his sleep, he was receiving messages from God wow. and he was listening and then he woke up and it said right when he woke up, he did exactly what the, so wait, just what the angel told him. <laughs> anyone listening who's discerning something, <laughs> if you decide something and you're at peace about it after using the best of your reason and your abilities, don't go change that decision if you don't get a dream. Yes, like, yeah, like, yeah, if I you know. get a miraculous oh dream, then yeah, go with what you Thank think you God's calling you, right? right? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. And if you but, get a dream of an angel, go ask a spiritual director about it. To confirm <laughs> where the angel's coming yeah. from. Yes, exactly. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Any other advice, Father Simon, for people who are wanting to grow in their faith, especially mm -hmm. younger people, especially in the crazy, like, yeah. you know, just, I, I, I just talked to a lot of people and they're, there's, I mean, marriages are struggling. People who are young, you know, struggling to build community, struggling to like live by the faith. And you're in San Diego. We're both in California. Mm -hmm. Like this is not like the most, you know, the culture here sometimes can be very tough. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing compared to sure. like ISIS in Iraq though. Mm -hmm. or, you know, yeah, I mean, we're so blessed here. We're so, you know, we have so many freedoms. Yeah. But it's, it's a different battle here. It's a different battle. It's, it's a like spiritual a battle more, yes. you know, yes, there was the spiritual battle aspect over there too, you know, battling Islam and all that. But here there's a, there's a different one and it's very subtle and it's very dangerous as well. And the one advice, the one piece of advice that I would give, which is, you know, very, very important. And this is from the Bible and the church, it's don't make it all about yourself and about 
what you know or about what you think it takes a lot of humility, which is the root of all virtues. It's the foundation to say and to accept the fact that I'm not in charge and that I don't know what's best for my life. The creator knows much better for me. So rely on the creator, not on the created or not on your own kind of flawed mentality. All of us have a darkened intellect because of sin, you know, mm -hmm. even though we have original sin removed from us after baptism, we still have the concupiscence, which is just the confusion of our hearts. All of us do. And so we can't rely on that. We are confused. We have darkened intellects. We cannot rely on ourselves, on our desires, which are changing. Mm -hmm. We have to rely on the rock, you know, the church, the, the foundation that Jesus gave us. The church is a mother for us. God is our father and he wants us to be members of that church community. So in a practical sense, I would say focus on the Bible and on the teachings of the church, especially on matters of faith and morals. All the moral teaching of, you know, the sexual teaching of the church is so important for us as human beings, the way that we'll use our desires, our, our souls and our bodies to love one another and to build the kingdom of God in this world. We can't do it only the way that we desire, we have to do it the way that God wants of us. And that's shown to us and it's taught to us through his church. There's one thing you said that I just want to follow up on because I think it's a, it's a misunderstanding today, especially about, about Catholics, mm -hmm. about priests and you hear are yeah. the priests, so you can answer, uh, you know, the, the sexual, the ethics of the church, you know, the moral teaching of the church, you know, no sexual activity before marriage. And then within marriage, there's a guideline for it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like just do whatever you, you get married and then whatever goes, it's yeah. like chastity before and after marriage mm -hmm. gift. Your body is a gift, right. a gift of self being open to life. These teachings are yeah. very countercultural. Mm -hmm. uh, I think even confusing to a lot of people, but I think a lot of people too on priestly celibacy, mm -hmm. I think is just crazy. Like they yeah. think you're crazy. I know. I know. And I'm sure you've gotten this <laughs> before, right? Yeah. Is it crazy? Is priestly celibacy crazy? Um, I don't think it's crazy. Um, I think that it's a, it's a beautiful gift that God has allowed us priests to give and to participate in his gift for the church. And I mean, people might say it's crazy just to have only one sexual partner, you know, one wife yeah, yeah. One husband. and, yeah. um, I think that we, we both have challenges and that, uh, Catholic man has a lot of challenges in his life to be faithful, but the more that he encounters Jesus and practices the virtue of chastity, the more he'll be faithful. And like I said, the more he will enjoy also mm -hmm. being a husband. And so I think priestly celibacy is a gift that God allows us to participate in, like I said. And there's actually something when I was discerning there's something that I heard from a priest. I, I forgot his name, but I was watching a thing on EWTN. Nice. Yeah. Our partner. Yeah. EWTN. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just heard that before this. That's, that's very cool. Thank you. EWTN. This is, yeah. Thank you for this. Gosh, it was this old Italian priest. I'm sure people will best. know. Besides yeah. the Chaldeans, I'm Italian. Yeah. So of course. The what, Italian. what was his name? Oh my gosh. Anyways, this is also another one of my core memories, especially in my discernment. I was a young high schooler and so I was, you know, attracted to a girl at the time and I was having struggles with that and with my, my discernment, but I knew somehow that God was calling me to become a priest or I was really, really convinced of it. And I was really confused about this desire that I had for the girl. And I remember this priest talking about that and I had just stumbled upon it watching e EWTN and he said, if, if the girl has a capacity to make you happy as a man, where does she get the capacity from? She gets it from God. God is the, the creator. As a celibate priest, you're cutting out the middle man or woman. <laughs> you're going directly to God, who is the source. So if he's calling you to that, trust that he's going to fulfill your happiness. And that was a huge step for me because it was a moment where I had to just trust in God and say, God, if you really want this from me, I know that you, that you will make me happy. Beautiful. And yeah. do you believe you're, you seem pretty happy. Yeah. Yeah. Very happy. Working I, so far. I would not change it for, for anything in the world. Beautiful. Yeah. Father, where can people find your stuff? Like you're, you have a podcast too, or a couple yeah, podcasts, so, it sounds like, and then your TikTok uh -huh, sure. and Instagram. Yeah. So I do have my personal social media pages, mostly on TikTok and Instagram. 
little bit on X, but uh, TikTok, Instagram, you can just type in Father Simon and I post a lot of content on their daily prayers. I do the rosary on most days on their live. And like you said, I started a podcast with my priest friends. Uh, it's a Catholic media company, Chaldean Catholic media company called Qurbana Media, which is the Aramaic word for Eucharist. And we have a show called Feeding Fathers on, on there where it's just a long form podcast show where we talk about cultural topics and bring them to, um, from a Catholic perspective. And I will be starting hopefully soon a kids Bible study show. So I'm uh, really looking I forward that to that. Idea. Yeah. And the Feeding Fathers, you talk and then you go eat. We talk and eat. Yeah. Yep. I should eat. I, this show, we, where's, we our, love <laughs> where's our lunch? <laughs> I know. I love it. Thank you so yeah. much, Father Simon. Thank you so Great much for having for me, Lila. And thank you for your work and your witness um, in the Catholic world, but especially in the pro-life movement. We're, we're praying for you and we in the Chaldean community, we love your ministry and, and we support you all the way. Well, I love when I see Chaldean, the Chaldean young people and priests outside the abortion mm -hmm. clinics praying. Yeah. It's so beautiful. So yeah. thank you for that ministry. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, Father. A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the world's leading Catholic network, reaching millions with the truth about the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com.